I want to start off this module with a little bit of a quote. Obstacles in the mind are much more important than obstacles along the journey. And the reason I want to start off with a quote is you really got to dissect this quote apart. Obstacles in the mind. In social engineering, what you're doing is you're taking away, removing, or alleviating these obstacles in the mind that someone may have to overcome what obstacles may be in the journey. Okay? So let's say we want something like you know, a password or something like that. Well, if you could strategically plant information in someone's mind, well, they might strategically give you, voluntarily give you some information that could yield a password, okay? So keep that quote in mind as we move throughout social engineering. Let's take a look, okay? The targets here. The targets are often, often office workers because they are the closest to our assets or the closest to the things that corporations typically want to protect. It's certainly not limited to office workers. I mean, realistically, anybody can be socially engineered. Um, but the context of this module, we'll, we'll keep it at social um, or office workers. Okay? The skills in which you need to be good at social engineering really have two foundations. Um, one is based in the science and the other is based in the arts. Okay? So there's you know, technical ways to do this, um, but there's very much an artistic craft to social engineering as well. So good interpersonal skills add to the value of the person uh, doing the social engineering. It's also helpful to be very, very talkative. The more talkative you are, um, the more conversational you can be, the more information you could ultimately get out of someone. Also, it's a great idea to be creative. You know, why try to break AES 256-bit encryption when you can socially engineer the password and get access to what you need? So we always want to take the path of least resistance. Good communication skills um, kind of aid in being talkative and creative as well. Now, the most common mechanisms in which we carry out social engineering attacks are basically emails um, on the phone or in person. Any one of those mediums is fair game in terms of carrying out a social engineering attack. Let's go into the techniques. Okay? There's a lot of different techniques in which you can apply, but here's just a handful of the basics here. Um, from, a, from doing this on a computer, someone can be socially engineered. S someone could be socially engineered through spam, right? Just send someone an email, uh, you know, you've won a million dollars, click here now, right? And they want that million dollars, so, you know, they'll click on the link. Uh, through chat, chat is an easy mechanism because uh, we typically don't authenticate chat conversations or we assume that the person on the other end of the chat line is the person in which their name or handle is. Um, chain letters, hoaxes, even pop-ups, uh, phishing attacks or any derivative of phishing attacks. Later we'll talk about spear phishing specifically. It could be a fake application or through uh, SMS text. Uh, you could easily text someone, hey I lost my um, contacts in my phone, uh, please validate blah, 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 right? Um, and that's an easy way to do it just over, uh, you know, phone text um, or even over social sites. Uh, being that we're all connected socially, there's been a, a surplus of fake profiles that have made it to LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter and things like YouTube and things like that. Uh, so while computer is, computer techniques are uh, very, very popular, certainly not limited to that. Human, okay, you could just show up live and in person, do this one-on-one, -on -one, right? Pretending to be a legitimate person or a, an important person like a CEO or a new hire or something to that capacity. Um, or the, the most common is probably being part of the support staff. Hey, I'm so and so, I'm here to fix your computer, give me your username and password and I'll go ahead and fix it and get you back to work. Uh, so um, pretending to be support staff. Spear phishing, 
very, very targeted phishing. Phishing is just, you know, fake emails that go out pretending to be something. But spear phishing is now you're, you're, you're targeting. The reason why we call it phishing is because you're just throwing out a net and seeing what you catch. Well, now you're just doing that in a highly targeted manner. Your net becomes a lot smaller or a lot focused to your target. Nowadays, we can also do it over the phone. Okay, so uh, it happens uh, in the mobile application. Uh, there's been a handful of malicious apps. Uh, it could be something as simple as um, everybody wants additional batteries on their uh, battery power on their on their cell phone. So then maybe there's a fake app that says, "Hey, you know, boost your battery life by 35 percent." And some you know somebody's in their app store and they go, "Oh, I really really need to do that." So they download it, at this malicious app, and the malicious app profiles their phone and then um, exfiltrates data from their phone. Uh, it could be eavesdropping. Right? Just passively listening and paying attention to certain things depending on where you are. It could be while you're in a customer service line, it could be while you're at a lunch line. Something as simple as that. Shoulder surfing, you could be in an office place and just happen to be looking over someone's shoulder and gain access to information. Or basically watch, uh, watch them type their password a bunch of times and each time you focus on a different finger. I mean if they use this finger, how many times when they, when they uh, log into a, a site, well then you know at least what characters uh, th their password is made up of and then you can slowly start building that password. Um, dumpster diving, simply going to the trash. Tailgating, following someone through a, an access control point. Um, it could happen in person. It, you can have reverse social engineering. There's books on, this, on the subject of reverse, reverse social engineering. In other words, instead of me trying to social engineer you, I present myself in some way where you feel inclined to voluntarily give me the information. So instead of me trying to get it out of you, you voluntarily give the information to me in hopes of some reward later. Or piggybacking, uh, which is a derivative of tailgating. Now the impacts here, okay? Organizations can suffer drastically uh, for a variety of reasons. Social engineering just happens to be one of those ways um, which you can suffer large amounts of impact. So let's look at what impact means. Um, it could be a loss of privacy, right? If a pa it could be something as simple as a password, but that password could get you access to more sensitive information um, like confidential or secret or top secret documents or something like that. You could result in loss of goodwill or loss of reputation to an organization. Uh, in the worst case scenario, you could go out of business, right? Depending on what the nature is of what got socially engineered, you certainly could find yourself out of business. Nowadays, we're just, you're seeing it in um, terrorism, okay? Uh, financial loss. Uh, what if it's uh, the secret ingredients of, uh, you know, Colonel Sanders' secret recipe, right? Well, if that's uh, uh, proprietary information for, that's critical for a company to survive, and now all of a sudden everybody can make that great chicken, well, then the information is no longer confidential and you know your competitive advantage may be lost. Um, theft. Now traditional theft would yield uh, you know bank accounts and credit card numbers and things like that but there's really nothing that you couldn't uh, limit yourself to. Uh, identity theft. That's a big topic all in itself. You know what's the identity theft market worth these days? Uh, you know last uh, I heard it's uh, multiple billions of dollars. Um, so why does all of this happen, right? It happens because you really in the world of social engineering you're taking advantage of human nature. You're using your social skills to strategically get something out of someone, right? So people want to naturally be helpful. Well if you can use that to your advantage as a penetration tester, well then you do, okay? Also ignorance. Well, th this is the, well, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to give them that, right? If they didn't know, they weren't trained, uh, well, that's why you can get uh, this valuable information or why you can be socially engineered. O open promises, okay? 
That's just another one. You could promise something, somebody give you something, uh, and then you'll never make good on that promise. Meanwhile, you already have what you need. You perform your penetration testing attack. You know, this often uh, ends in the context of, well, I'll be back in a few minutes and I'll give you the information that I promised you. Meanwhile, you never come back, okay? Uh, they feel morally obligated to, right? They want it to be helpful. You know, this is where, you know, you pretend uh, I've got to work here late and it's going to take me five hours to do this, but if I just had that password, I could leave with you. Well, the person that you're telling that to, they may feel morally obligated to, you know what, I'll just give you my credentials so I can, so you can get the job done faster so you don't have to stay here all night and work, okay? Uh, no training. Simply stated, uh, people aren't trained, they're not aware. Um, look at the demographics of uh, the office space. So if people aren't getting trained, they don't know about this stuff, they don't know when they're getting socially engineered and when they're not getting socially engineered. Um, and that makes you know, getting a password 60 and 70% of the time uh, very, very, very likely. Also, a lot of this information is easily accessible, so you're just naturally walking around the uh, workspace or office space, and if things are easily accessible because you don't have a clean desk policy or something to that nature, well, you know, that could result in a social engineering attack. Weak policies, um, and also it's difficult to detect. In the world of viruses and Trojans, um, it's pretty easy to write a signature to say, you know, hey, meet this criteria, okay, alert. Well, if people aren't trained, uh, tying into it being difficult to detect, you know, how do you really know if you're being socially engineered? How do you know just the person isn't trying to be a good person, okay? So those are just some of the, the top reasons on why social engineering happens. Um, the value here in which the penetration tester is generally going after, okay? Uh, we can chalk this up to confidential information. Ideally, you'd like to get some sort of authentication or authorization information so that you can get access to things that, you, that a regular user, or in this case, the pen tester, doesn't have access to. Uh, so some sort of authentication or access control. Those are very, very valuable in the scope of social engineering. Some of the tools that we will use are the Social Engineering Toolkit. This is the first really major project um, where there's a computer program and it walks you through a little wizard or tutorial and you can craft your phishing attack or craft your social engineering toolkit uh, attack and then go ahead and launch it. Primarily uh, in computer-based attacks, but there are some script-oriented things for uh, being in person. So let's go ahead and talk about some of the countermeasures. If you want to stop social engineering to your organization, well, best practices apply here. Simply stated, change your passwords. Because we're looking, penetration testers are looking for authentication and access control, something as simple as a change of a password on a regular basis and not using you know, the same password over and over and over again, that reduces the likelihood of the penetration tester being successful. Also, um, you'll see these in the financial world. Account lockouts, um, account logout, uh, log out functions or account expirations. Um, not to say that it's not limited to just the banking or the financial world, but you'll see those a little bit more. Um, like if you go to your bank account, uh, if you have 15 minutes of inactivity, boom, you get locked out or uh, logged off rather. Um, training, all right? If people were trained on what social engineering is, uh, then they might be inclined to not participate in what they would think would be a social engineering attack. Also, keep sensitive information secret or private. It's just that simple. If you know what is sensitive because you have a classification system, um, well then, then you're not going to disclose it to people who don't have that access. Also, when it comes to a facility, any sort of guests should ultimately be escorted and those escorts uh, should stay with the people that they're escorting. Shred your documents. Have strict access control techniques. Use a classification program. Um, one of my favorites, since I have a background in inf incident response, is uh, actually have a capability to identify 
detect, contain, eradicate, and recover uh, social engineering attacks along with any other attack, whatever it be. Also, do a lot of pre-screening. Before you hire someone, make sure that it's someone that you actually want to give access to. Don't just hire people off the street and say, okay, here's uh, you know, access to my sensitive information. Make sure that they're of you know, a good, uh, solid background uh, and they don't have any sort of criminal uh, background, then that should help. But the, just the background checks in itself um, kind of is a screening piece of it. Also, use two-factor authentication. Remember uh, the multi-factor and the two-factor, okay? This is based in something that you know, something that you have, and something that you are. So instead of just authenticating with something that you know, use two-factor means now you're using something that you know and something you have, or something you have and something that you are. Okay, so we call that two-factor or multi-factor. Use a change management program. That way you can track changes throughout the organization or improvements. Um, and then of course, in a virus or anti-phishing software. Now with the whole subject of social engineering, there's, there's a whole landscape here in which the penetration tester, tester can be very, very creative and ultimately get sensitive information. Again, this is an art and a science, but let's go back to the quote from the beginning, right? Obstacles in the mind are more important than obstacles along the journey. We're going to use these obstacles in the mind and overcome them in someone's mind so that we don't have those obstacles throughout the journey or let's say throughout the journey we want to get to some sort of sensitive or critical information. Well, if we can tap into somebody's mind using our social skills, well then they might voluntarily just give us the account information or give us the passwords. And that's why it's really important to approach this as not only a, a, a science and all the computer stuff, but also using your interpersonal skills and communication skills so that you can achieve your objective. So that is the basic makeup of social engineering.